Hey, everybody, and welcome to State of the Hack. I'm Austin Baker. And I'm Doug Beanstalk. And without much further ado, we're going to get into it. So our topic for this episode is all about web shells, your favorite remote access tool and code execution method that doesn't get nearly enough attention and love for how sophisticated and complicated they can be. Uh, but before we dive into that, let's talk about in the news. Uh, Doug, definitely one thing stuck out in terms of catching yeah. headlines. Uh, there was a breach of a water treatment facility, I believe, uh, in the state yeah. of Florida, uh, remote access of TeamViewer, uh, at least that's what's been reported. And, you know, uh, apparently someone attempted to adjust uh, chemical balances or, or something based on the report that was provided. Um, definitely not the first ICS breach that we've seen, uh, no. so it won't be the last. Um, any thoughts from your perspective, you know, what, how does TeamViewer factor into this? What, what yeah. should we know? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Like I've never, I don't think I've heard of a, of a ICS breach where TeamViewer was involved, but you know, every time when we do our, our IRs or compromise assessments at Mandiant, you know, I'm always surprised at the number of systems we see with some form of third party remote access solution, whether it's TeamViewer or oh, yeah. Daneware or VNC Viewer. And it's some, you know, part of me is like, what, what year is it? Like, why are we still seeing this? But it still seems you know, integral to certain teams' operations. And uh, yeah, you know, I think the, the point to drive home there is, you know, from the governance side and just from the IT operations side, like getting a handle on that, I think is really, really tough. But clearly, as this breach demonstrates, very important, right? It's probably kind of falling outside of the standard monitoring and standard controls that the IT and security teams have, and it can have some pretty big impacts. Yeah, definitely access of, you know, access of legitimate remote access methodologies like VPNs or TeamViewer or, you know, yeah. VNC. Um, we see that exploited by attackers all the time and it's so difficult to detect proactively. You know, in this case, it was detected and mitigated. Um, but yeah, no, fortunately, <laughs> and, like no one was, no one was hurt. And at the end of the day, you know, uh, it just definitely is getting a lot of attention in social media. Uh, Doug and I have worked on ICS incidents and both on the red teaming side and then the incident response side, but by no means are we incident response experts. And there's definitely a lot of uh, somewhat sketchy takes on some of these things. So um, as a passing word of caution, make sure you're uh, curating your ICS experts on social media and you know don't believe everything that gets thrown out there because there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation related to this particular incident. Uh, and we just want to make sure that everyone at the end of the day gets the facts and knows what they need to take action on. So just keep an eye out for that. But moving yeah. on to the much more interesting uh, component and the meteor component of this talk, uh, yeah. web shells. Uh, so Doug, what is a web shell? I really like web shells and talking about them because I think they go under the radar a lot in terms of red teaming and IR investigations, um, but they're very important. And I think they come up quite often. And so, you know, at the base of it, a web shell is a piece of code that someone has inserted on a, usually on an internet facing web server that allows the threat actor to interact with that operating system. So to run actual commands against the system, right? Through a web browser or, you know, in the case of some web shells through, you know, curl commands or a thick client. But the point is the, the protocol is just simple HTTPS connections, just like you would access any other part of that website. And you know they're popular and they're they're sneaky because it's not necessarily a binary that's running. It's just a flat text file that is then, you know, maybe it's interpreted and compiled down. Um, but it's a lot harder to detect. And by very nature, these web servers are internet facing, and so it's a very attractive target for threat actors uh, if they want maybe a secondary way, way into the network, or in a lot of cases, like we'll talk about today, the first uh, foothold into a network. Yeah, and uh, web shells have, it, it's interesting because we, you know, we track so many malware families yeah. across so many incidents, but the one that sort of sticks out to me is, is what was originally very much an APT style of, mm -hmm. of malware, but then became ubiquitous across threat groups was China Chopper. So the sort yeah. of OG, tiny, tiny one line web shell for code execution um, almost became sort of a way of life as opposed to just a singular uh, web shell. And we've just seen kind of explosions uh, in sophistication uh, uh, along those lines, just people coming up with crazy new techniques and full, you know, full UI GUI supported web oh, shells yeah. with interactive buttons and 
just so much interesting stuff. But um, in this case, because the topic, the range is so broad, we're going to focus on just one sort of case study, one particular piece of you know typically web-facing uh, application tech called Teleric, uh, Teleric Web UI specifically, yeah. um, and its uh, vulnerability. So in particular, CVE 2019-18-935, but that's just a, a long preamble. Essentially, it's a, a deserialization vulnerability. Now, uh, Doug, I know you looked into this. Uh, what? Give me a little bit of background. What is Teleric? What does it do? Where might one find it? Yeah, so Teleric is, is really everywhere, and, and you know, it's a popular UI component for .NET web apps. So a lot of people use .NET web apps. And when you're building a GUI, a lot of people tend to use Telerik. And you know it provides all sorts of functionality, like form uploads, which we'll actually talk about a little bit later, um, you know, login pages, uh, et cetera. But it's, it's very popular. It's used by a lot of developers. And what we also found is when organizations bring in third-party software, that third-party software might also be using Telerik under the hood. And that's why I think this CVE that we talk about and how it's being exploited is important because you know people might not be aware that this you know third-party software they introduced into their environment is using any number of other libraries, right? That also may have dependencies and also need to be patched. And I think just in general, patching components, whether it's you know pip packages, Python packages installed via pip or Telerik UI. They're probably not patched as often as they should be um, because you just really don't think about it, or at least I don't think a lot of organizations think about it. Well, yes, and uh, the the difficulty is when application vendors start having to issue patches for subcomponents that they integrate and keep right. track of. You know, is the core package vulnerable, or is it something that you inherited? You know, what's the severity of it? Is it getting accurately yeah. reflected? It's it's difficult, but in this case. Uh, both of the vulnerabilities incorporated here were tagged up. They're quite old. They were yep. reported, patches were released, um, but there was a very interesting write-up, which apparently is quite popular in the uh, malicious hacker community, done by Bishop Fox back in 2019, if anyone can remember back that far, uh, December of 2019. Yeah, what year is it right now? I, can't... I, I, I think it's 2021. Uh, I'll have to check my, my Windows clock here. But um, so... Uh, they did a fantastic write-up uh, about some novel research that had been done uh, both of the earlier 2017 CVE, which was file upload, yep. uh, as well as a new CVE uh, uh, vulnerability that was deserialization. So when we say deserialization, what that really means, and this is something that comes up in a lot of application vulnerabilities, it's when an application attempts to interpret something as code, typically, or some sort of function of code, uh, bucket of executable pieces and attempts to determine, you know, what should I treat this as? Is it a class that I can, de you know, decompile, execute, move on? Um, is it a text file? Basically, it takes in a stream of data and tries to treat it as whatever structure you're informing. So in this case, the vulnerability allows you to, by combining the old CV for file upload, as well as the deserialization, you can upload uh, a DLL file in this case, for most of the attackers that we've seen in C Windows 10, and use the deserialization to incorporate that into the execution of the application with the Teleric vulnerability, and essentially execute that code in memory. So yeah. um, this is a pretty interesting entry point because it's not as simple as just uploading a web shell. You actually have to write code, uh, or in this case, use the code that was provided by Bishop Fox. So they provided both a, a test proof of concept, which just slept for 10 seconds. And then they actually provided a small C reverse shell, which was quite interesting, um, which actually became the basis of uh, a web shell that we saw uh, attackers using uh, to exploit this in in real, you know, sort of real life, right, in the wild. Yeah. So um, in terms of the different shells that we've seen dropped after post-exploitation, it, it runs the gamut. So, you know, we see very you know, simple groups using things like the the small shell variant, which is the uh, based off of the initial code that Bishop Fox wrote. Just yep. a simple pass command.exe something to run, and it passes the result back to you. Nothing sophisticated. It's basically China Chopper and a DLL. So, um, the uh, other attackers have used things like uh, ASPX Spy. Uh, so it's a that's a much more 
publicly available web shell, uh, has tons of functionality baked right into it, uh, but also much more easy to detect, right? So one of the things that I've noticed in these investigations, because we've seen this exploited quite frequently, especially recently, is these very simple methods um, actually uh, get caught quite frequently by antivirus, you know, oh. which, we, which we typically think of as sort of low on the totem pole of the right. detection area. But uh, attackers are getting uh, shiftier with their web shell usage and, and moving yeah. to much more custom payloads. So um, in particular, one that I, I had shared with you and, and that you know people had found interesting is yeah. uh, a new web shell variant that's actually uh, an ASPX file that's just C-sharp code. And in that C-sharp code, it, it takes in encoded byte uh, strings mm -hmm. and actually uses the .NET runtime serialization to deserialize the byte code yeah. and execute it in memory, which, uh, as far as I can tell, is not a publicly available technique. But I know that you have seen this deserialization code in a legitimate application yeah. before. Yeah, so I, you know, I think deserialization in itself is such a wide attack surface, right? I mean, there have been countless uh, conference talks and blog posts about deserialization in different op uh, different languages and different applications. You know, you have the great .NET to JScript uh, framework that's all about deserialization. You know, if anyone does Python development um, and you're using like the pickle module to deserialize things, right? It has big warnings in there, like warning when you're deserializing binary data. You know, you need to be very careful about what you're doing. Um, and then in, in .NET, you know, there's all these different potential avenues to get code executed when you deserialize. And, and I don't think it's really, you know, it's not a vulnerability in .NET, right? It's just when you think about deserialization, like you said, you're taking some sort of structured input and you're asking the code to somehow transform it. And that by its nature needs to be extremely flexible. And I think that's where developers run into a lot of trouble because there can be edge cases or other ways where you're just not aware. Like, you know, when if I'm a developer, when I coded this, I, all I intended was to unpack a JSON document. You know, I had no idea that if someone was able to change something ever so slightly, it would actually result in code execution. And uh, to answer your question, that's exactly what we found at a recent incident response engagement where the threat actor was able to gain access to this organization's web servers. And they couldn't figure out how, you know, day after day they were coming back, they couldn't figure out how. And so eventually, you know, we took the time intensive path of, you know, send us some of your code. Let's look at some of the actual code. I knew it was written in .NET, so I started to have a feeling. Um, and we actually found uh, an instance where the web application accepted user input and then sent that user input to a deserialization function, um, which could then result in code execution, right? And that's kind of like the classic or one of the classic web developer uh, lessons or tenants is never trust user supplied input, right? Mm -hmm. And they were breaking that rule, but the developers also had no idea. Like they, they were, ex honestly, they didn't even believe us at first that this deserialization function could result in code execution. So it's very tricky and it's, it's very dangerous, I think. Yes, and now, I mean, attacker tools, you know, as you mentioned, there's been so much talk about deserialization vulnerabilities that it so often now lead to web shells in so many different varieties yeah. that there's attacker tools that, that we've used on the red team, like Verb Suite, that now have plugins that will go and stuff serialized code for different languages yeah. as, in an automatic fashion and look for something weird to happen. Yeah. So, you know, whether it's, it's Java, .NET, any kind of, of sophisticated code language, you know, will accept, you know, in a lot of cases, serialized objects uh, from, from some input, uh, some of which comes directly from the user, some of which gets handed off from the user to internal functions. So yeah. it's, it's definitely an active problem and, and we're seeing, you know, in this case, something very, very interesting and cool where an attacker is using a web shell to, to feed it a stream of bytes and deserialize those bytes and then execute that code in memory, as yeah. opposed to the more traditional path of using built in uh, executables like command.exe or for Linux, you know, the standard SH or bash um, to 
execute code steps. Um, additionally, this particular web shell was quite interesting because not only was it used for the point of entry on the Telerik exploit, but the attacker actually used this and copied it over to internal web servers oh, that they had access to yeah. um, and used uh, I, basically web tunneling between systems to pass the bytes between systems as an very clever, yeah. proxy. No, it's very clever and it's very hard to detect, as you mentioned, because it's all encrypted HTTPS traffic at the end yeah. of the day. And yeah. one of the most valuable and yet least often preserved uh, pieces of forensic data is IIS logs on an yeah. compromised IIS server. So if you don't catch it early on, it's, it's, it's possible you might miss it entirely. So yeah, and yeah. I, think, I think that's interesting as you know, well, I think we're going to talk about detection towards the end, but one of the ways that a lot of tools try and detect web shells is the parent process relationship, right? You know, why is w3 wp.exe spawning command.exe? Now, mm -hmm. some clients have told me, well, that's actually part of our web app, um, but putting that aside, that's a pretty good detection logic, but it is kind of brittle, especially when you talk about this new technique where, yeah, the threat actor is actually just accepting a stream of bytes and then loading that into memory and invoking it within the same process. So, you know, your EDR technology, maybe there are some, some thread manipulations, memory manipulations, but um, the kind of, I don't want to call it gold standard, but what used to be a very common detection of parent-child relationships is no longer there. And that I think is interesting and it's just, it's kind of very interesting from a uh, Intel and from an IR perspective to see kind of like the evolution of web shells like you talked about where, you know, China Chopper was very much in the APT realm. And then I think what happened is that source code got posted on a forum, right, years and years ago. And then everyone under the sun started using it. Um, and then you have, yeah, these web shells with like their fancy UIs. I've definitely seen ones that have like images and, you know, oh, advertise a Bitcoin wallet for donations. Um, and now you have this one, which is like just loading bytes into memory and running them, which is, I think, pretty pretty advanced. Yeah, it's it's a it's slick and it's not publicly available. So someone put some time and effort into uh, writing it. Um, there are comments in it, uh, yeah. so lines are commented out. So clearly, some some active development going on. But uh, yeah, and one thing we didn't touch on, which also appeared in the same case that this showed up, was yeah. The, the concept of no longer having to create your own standalone web shell, but inserting stubs of web shell code into legitimate files, which I yeah. know, you know, the most often example of, of inserting code uh, into a legitimate function for malicious purposes was the old credit card scrapers that you had used yeah. to use like embedded JavaScript to, yeah. to fork off data to your attacker server. And that's becoming more popular on the web shell side because it's so difficult to detect. But um, speaking of detection, you know, obviously we would be remiss if we spent all this time admiring how right. cool web shells are if we right. didn't spend as much time talking about methods that you know we use to detect them as well as the most common tools mm -hmm. um, that you'll find out you know in your toolbox to help detect and prevent them. So um, I'll talk about the first one, which is near near and dear to my heart because I come from you know also a pen testing background. Is uh, yeah. web application firewalls are your friend. And the reason why they're your friend is because they stop most of the basic scraping, probing, reconnaissance type behaviors. Right. Um, and with really good tuning, you know, if you look at the application, what's legitimate, what's not, you have a very effective early warning system for yeah. IP addresses that are not looking to interact with your application in a friendly, you know, normal user way. Right. Um, and uh, you know, if you have a good WAF or like a cloud WAF, even if you don't patch your Telerik or you forget to, or you don't even know your web app uses it, if your WAF is on top of their game, they'll build in detections or block lists for whatever, you know, URI stem or whatever it is to exploit that vulnerability. So even though you haven't patched it and you still should, you, you get a little bit more of a grace period because your WAF is on, is on top of things and it's blocking those request patterns. Yeah, and, and we saw that most effective with the old OWASP issue of SQL injection, right. which which was mostly encapsulated and blocked, you know, by the web application firewall layer. But of course, those vulnerabilities still exist. And in fact, the the downside of web application firewalls is, of course, there's a lot of research and active uh, insight into bypassing 
sliding things around, encoding yeah. them in ways that the, the web application firewall no longer recognizes. Yeah. So it's a great first line of defense, but by no means perfect. Right, and actually at this uh, organization I was speaking about earlier, they had a cloud waff in front of their sites. So they thought they were pretty well protected, but what they didn't realize is a couple of servers were directly accessible by IP address. Mm. And they thought that they had you know, fixed that or that that was blocked, but for whatever reason, a couple of servers weren't. And you know, probably just by nature of scanning the entire internet, like all these threat actors do, they found these two web servers that they could access without going through the WAF, and then it was, you know, it was off to the races for them. Interesting. Yeah, which I, f I found interesting. And whenever I'm doing this kind of assessment, that's always the first question I ask. You know, when someone says, "Oh, our web application is load balanced, or it's behind a WAF," you know, it's important to ask. Well, okay, that's great, but are the servers directly accessible? And you know, have you verified that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see where that would become a problem, especially if the the load balancing is um, not if not every part of the application is on the same version and the load balancing is potentially split among different versions of the same application. Yeah. Um, speaking of application management, I mean, we can obviously talk about patching, right? So yeah. the best thing to do is, is if you get a CVE or if you're tracking CVEs for your applications, apply the patch as soon as reasonable. Yeah. But, um, you and I both know it's, it's, you live in Wonderland if you think that you can patch enterprise applications immediately upon notification. Especially so, when it might be customer facing, right? Like it, probably right. deploy windows and change yeah. freezes, yeah. Yep, exactly. And uh, you know, you had mentioned at the very beginning, but there's also a very real problem of, of people not knowing all the components of the applications that they install. So even if you did know there was a Telerik CVE uh, for this remote code execution, um, you would, need to find out uh, how, you know, how many servers actually have this embedded. So in our investigation, we actually ran a scan for the Telerik oh. UI DLL to identify oh, cool. every application in the environment that actually had it embedded. And there was some amount of surprise as to how many applications actually had this incorporated. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, most of them were patched, but, you know. Yeah, I think your, your point also about the DLL just reminded me, you know, that's something that we, we see sometimes that everyone's not aware of is, you know, especially with .NET, you can have the web shell in its, I don't know what to call it, I guess in its just plain written form, you know, ASPX or uh, files, but those eventually get compiled down to DLLs and it's actually right, the DLL that IIS is using. And so we've definitely seen threat actors that will skip the ASPX stage and just copy a DLL somewhere where, and they, you know, they're aware of exactly how it works with IIS and how to get it sort of into the module chain so that it can process a web request um, without even needing an ASPX file, right? And so that's mm -hmm. where detection again gets tricky because maybe you're blocking new ASPX files, but you're not looking for uh, new DLLs being compiled into that directory or, you know, new uh, modules being added to the web.config file, right? There's there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat with IIS and .NET. Yeah, and, and speaking of blocking files, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, when most people think, you know, how do I block web shells? They're thinking, all right, you use some sort of file integrity monitoring, right? Like, don't let them create files that are new to the system that I don't yeah. trust, and also don't let them modify files that yeah. belong on the system that I do that I do trust. And, I mean, exactly to your point, you know, one of the issues is if you're trying to monitor for new creation of files extension matters and web servers are inherently flexible, right? So ASPX can, you know, have just as much compiled code as say an RESX file, right? Which you may not have seen before or mm -hmm. different, uh, different uh, file extensions that the IS web server knows how to handle transparently yeah. that maybe you're not familiar with and, and can't write explicit detections for. So yeah. this is where the benefit of, of uh, some sort of file integrity monitoring because you can track both when new files show up on a system that that weren't there before, um, as well as the most dangerous part where existing trusted files have web shell code inserted into them, and you can, you know, uh, get a quick notification as to hey this yeah. might have been modified from an untrusted user or untrusted yeah. application. And, um, and I think. 
No, I was going to say, you know, when, when you're talking about the file integrity monitoring, that's, I think that's a great thing to put in place. I think some organizations have trouble with it, but one thing that reminded me of is, you know, I think web servers in particular are great places to apply security baselines, you know, whether you use NIST or something else, um, because as uh, this Telerik exploit showed and a lot of other ones, um, the threat actor may try to write a DLL to disk and, you know, C colon slash temp, I, by default, anyone can write to that folder. And maybe that's okay on the workstations and some of your other servers, but on a web server that's internet facing, this is a great place to apply some sort of baseline and lock down those default file system permissions so that the uh, user that the web server is running under, which is hopefully one of those like app pool accounts, really can't write anywhere that could result in, in execution, right? I think that's important. Yeah, and, and that's a, a perfect segue to the next topic, which is uh, hardening your web server, right? So, so this is something that is most often neglected. And, and I think the reason is after reading trying to read documentation on this exact subject, it's not well understood. Yeah. And therefore it's it's the thing that people think less about. So um, one of the most frustrating things that always happened to me on a pen test is when I found a file upload vulnerability, often in the form of say, uploading an image to something and I could yeah. figure out how to browse to it, I go to my, my web shell and it would just give me text. Right. right? It, yeah. it wouldn't compile it, it wouldn't execute it because the application had set explicit directory boundaries as to where executable code can be and where executable code can't be. Yeah. And it had boundaries on, you know, what's the default compiler that it's going to use? When do the web shells get compiled? You know, is it is it all the web shell, you know, all the, the contents of the directory get compiled once you request one piece of the folder, or do you have to individually compile them by accessing them one-on-one? -on -one? So there's a lot of components on the IIS side, especially like you said, app pool segregation, you yeah. know, making sure that each web application has its own app pool account and that those accounts are discrete and, yeah. and they can't, they can't uh, interact with each other's file components. You know, one application can't write files to a different application's directory, even to, even though technically they're all homed on the same system. Right. Yeah. And, you know, just, basic network filtering and proxying. You know, we're talking about web shells, which is where, you know, the threat actor initiates the connection, right? Which is another reason they're very attractive to threat actors. Um, but still, uh, and as you mentioned, they may then drop a back door that actually does C2 or a reverse shell. And, you know, again, web proxying or filtering, a web server needs to accept connections, but it probably does not need to initiate connections or you can at least whitelist those maybe to a couple of your cloud partners. Um, so just, you know, basic hardening, like you said, is I think goes a long way here. Yeah, network network protections, understanding network flows, what's anomalous. I mean, that'll always buy you a ton of protection, but in this case, because the behaviors are very well defined, for example, if you have a standard application, it interacts with a database internally, but nothing else, well, it's a perfect opportunity for you to set some very granular firewall yeah. rules, both on the the physical side as well as the software side to limit that connectivity. And uh, frankly, from my perspective, and I think you probably agree with this, just assume that your web server is gonna get popped one day, right? Just yeah. assume for the sake of planning, it's gonna get popped. How can I limit the exposure on the network? How can I limit the exposure of credentials? How can I limit the exposure of sensitive data? If I just assume that this has been lost, right? That is a great starting point when you're thinking about planning out your DMZ and how to protect these sensitive components from just one web server being popped. And all the methods that we just talked about, you can roll those individually into different sections of the DMZs to prevent cross-pollination, yeah. cross-contamination of data. Just, you know, yeah. a well-segmented network is one of the most frustrating things to attack from, from a red teamer's perfect. perspective, because you're so close, but yet you're so far away from anything meaningful. Yeah. And, um, I'm yeah. glad you mentioned DMZ because I think that's an important important aspect of any network. And you know, I, I get surprised every time when I work a case like this where you know an organization they don't really have a well defined DMZ. And you know, I, I get that sometimes it can be difficult if you have complex applications that need to reach back to a database system you know that was made years ago and sits smack in the middle of the corporate network. Um, but to as best an ability as possible everyone should try and establish a DMZ, an untrusted zone, right? Because um, to your point, it's a good assumption. You know, our, our CEO, Kevin Mandy, always says, you know, assume that you're breached or assume you're going to get breached one day. 
And a good place to start with that assumption is uh, your internet facing web servers. Yep. So yeah, that's, I mean, that is web shells in a nutshell, right? That's uh, <laughs> what we know on the latest. I mean, obviously web shells are super cool because it's such a flexible way. You know, you don't have to spend as much time developing like a command and control server right. as you do developing a web shell. So there's a lot of flexibility and people are iterating on stuff all the time. So it's always super cool to see. Yeah. I mean, final thoughts on web shells, Doug. I mean, I, I think we, as, a, as an industry, need to do a better job at finding some clever ways to detect them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, organizations need to really keep patching of all sorts of libraries in mind and, and segmentation. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, you and I will, uh, as this is airing, maybe send out a couple of tweets about that small shell sample, right, and maybe some other research uh, that people can kind of read up on that we've mentioned. Oh, yeah, definitely going to look to provide some some areas of, of research because, uh, like you said, it's, it's an often neglected, but uh, it, it's you know, almost like tossing a coin for any incident that we investigate if there's a web shell involved. Right? Yeah. So yeah. definitely something to have good coverage on and to understand. And I think this goes a long way to it. Um, but on that note, uh, yeah. you know, as much as we had fun talking about web shells, uh, unfortunately for me, this will be my last state of the hack podcast. Um, but I've had an amazing, amazing time, especially working with you, Doug. Uh, but the larger state of the hack team as well, because there's a lot yeah. of people involved in this that yes. you know, the audience may not get to see. Yes. Um, and a lot and goes just, into the making. Yes, a lot goes into the making. Uh, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. And we love sharing these cool, interesting things with you guys. And I've been extremely, extremely grateful to get the chance to be a part of it, right? Because, you know, working with guys like Doug, Julian, Evan, you know, these are the the, the top of the top in terms of what's going on in the IR world, the red team world, you know, developments in the Intel side, you know, we've got, we've had amazing guests on the show. Um, it's been such a pleasure. And, you know, from my perspective, the security community has been really nice and really uh, just embraced us and supportive. And yeah. I'm extremely thankful to the, the security community, which I think, you know, despite all the, you know, maybe fights or, or arguments about things like, uh, uh, you know, whose security tools are better. Um, at the end of the day, I think when, when the chips are down and people need help and it comes to protecting people from these cyber threats, I think the whole community has been just Definitely. amazing at coming together. So um, to the State of the Hack fans, I hope to see you at the next event or conference uh, when it's safe for us to meet up. But until then, as always, we'll see you on the front lines. See ya. Bye.